Uh, it's been found in recent years that they have social systems strikingly similar to those of primates, whales, and elephants. Really? Yeah. Like they have an alpha bat and they have a bat sure. leader? They, really? They, they know each other. In my own banding studies years ago, I banded 40-some thousand bats in one study. And uh, I showed that over periods of a decade, sometimes you'd find the same bats that like you caught four or five bats together in a place at one time 10 years before. And then you might catch them five years later, two miles away, 10 years later, 20 miles away, all still together. Wow. And bats not only know each other and have what we, you know, we used to criticize people soundly for what we call anthropomorphizing. But uh, that's almost getting to be a, an out-of-date word as we find more about what animals really do and think. Uh, bats help each other in need. Uh, they'll adopt orphans. They form apparently long-term friendships. There are all kinds of cool things that are going on in the world of bats. So our, our previous thoughts about bats the their primitive it's it's really just based on a lack of examination lack of understanding for sure mm. one thing i would like to point out to your listeners all these things that we're talking about in these pictures you're seeing i have thousands of those pictures available on my website at merlintuttle.org and you can go there and see all these things that you're seeing glimpses of now now, are there some bats that are more complex than other bats, that are more intelligent than other bats? Well, let me tell you an interesting story. After I learned to train frog-eating bats for my research, I thought, well, these carnivores are just, they're smarter than other bats. And it never dawned on me that other bats might be trainable too, especially really small bats. And then one time I went out to West Texas and I caught a fairly large pallid bat, and I wanted to take a picture for National Geographic of it catching centipedes six, eight inches long. They, they're immune to the stings, and they eat centipedes and scorpions. And uh, so I was training this bat to come to my hand on call because I was going to put in a natural-looking set a centipede and call it to come down and catch the centipede to get the picture. And... Uh, after the bat finally got too full to want to come again, I had this little western pipistrel that weighs less than a nickel, tiny little bat, body about that big. So you're, sh you're holding up the tip of your pinky. Yeah, and, and that bat had been in my portable studio watching me train the bigger bat, and when the bigger bat decided not to come on call, the little bat came and got the reward. And I couldn't believe it. Here was this little guy that I was sure didn't have enough intelligence to be trained, and it trained by just watching me train another bat. Wow. And let me— uh, Do you think it's watching and observing, or do you think there's some other information that might be being distributed, whether it's through sound or whether it's through some sort of— maybe some sort of like some— <sighs> unknown connection that they have to each other, pheromonal connection, psychic connection? Well, pheromones certainly play a role, but uh, mostly everything that I've seen, I would ascribe to intelligence and thinking. Uh, let An me, observation. <clears throat> let, let me tell you a story that really still boggles my mind. My wife and I had gone to Borneo and set up my portable photo studio, we we're going to photograph little woolly bats that weigh less than a nickel. <clears throat> Again, tiny, tiny little guys. And they live out in swamps where there's no way we could go out in the swamp to photograph. And they live in pitcher plants. And get this, the pitcher plant puts up a reflector over the top to guide the bat to get to the pitcher plant and then has a special ridge inside where he can sleep, almost like providing a bunk bed. And uh, we had gone out there to photograph these bats, but we couldn't do it out in the swamp because it rained every little bit and you're wading waist deep and there are poisonous snakes hanging from the vines and it just wasn't a good place to take pictures. So we caught this bat, brought it back to my studio, 
And the first evening, I hand-fed it mealworms, holding it one hand and ha handing it mealworms with the other. And uh, then the next morning, when my wife and I came back to the studio, this bat was hanging up in one corner of the studio, and it immediately recognized me. It didn't try to go to her. She didn't feed it before. <clears throat> it came to me and started bumping me in the nose. In fact, I, I believe you may have a video of that that you can share. He started bumping me in the nose, and I don't know how I so quickly figured it out, but I figured out that he wanted to be fed. He wasn't really attacking me. And uh, so my wife saw this and said, uh, get your shirt on. It was really hot, and I didn't have a shirt on. And get your shirt on, and she grabbed the camera. Watch this bat. He's coming up pestering me to give him a mealworm. He's wow. only one time in his whole life eaten a mealworm, only one time gotten it from me, <laughs> and how did he figure out that my face was the place to get my attention? Wow. And so I went and got my shirt on, she, and it was still doing this. Watch, when I held up my hand, it knew to come and get the mealworm. And this bat had never had a mealworm in his life before, may never have eaten a non-flying insect before, certainly never seen a human until the night before. Absolutely mind-boggling. Wow. <clears throat> That's wild. So that it just learned. It learned and it remembered you. Yeah. 